As convener of the workshop, I would like to express my gratitude also to all the speakers for having so kindly accepted to take part in, in this discussion and to share your expertise with us. And of course, to the audience too, for your interest in this workshop. We hope not to disappoint you. As uh, already advanced by, uh, by the chairman, I will present a kind of introductory <coughs> report in which I will introduce the subject, uh, point at the main questions we would like to address with you in this workshop, and also to advance my position in, in some of them. So, uh, cooperation with such countries uh, raise, uh, raises significant challenges from numerous perspectives when it comes to the fields of migration and asylum. But two legal issues stand out as crucial in my view with regard to the, the feasibility, the effectiveness, and even the consistency of the EU external action uh, on migration. And I refer, as uh, Professor Santos Vara has already indicated, on the one hand to the distribution of competences between the EU and its member states to establish any form of cooperation with third countries on migration and asylum. So who can do what? And on the other, to the determination of who is in charge of uh, expressing at the international level the positions adopted according to that distribution of powers. So who can speak on behalf of whom? Um, these are, as you know, particularly complex questions. And this is due, in my view, to two main factors. Firstly, the sensitivity that migration and foreign affairs still represent for national sovereignty, but also to the still ambiguous provisions of, the, of EU primary law concerning external action, particularly those codifying the ECJ doctrine on implied powers, to which recourse has to be made when it comes to, the, to most of the dimensions of, of migration, but also to those provisions related to the EU external representation, which have given rise to continuous and uh, quite uh, uh, serious disputes or tensions among EU institutions. I have devoted a part of, uh, important part of my research to analyze how the different objectives of this external dimension of the EU migration policy correspond to a complex intertwining of powers between the Union and its member states. And to put it very briefly, because uh, these are years of research that I would like to, to summarize in uh, one minute and a half, uh, we could say that EU exclusive external competences apply on short-term visas and on borders uh, on the basis of ERTA exclusivity. The uniform application of the visa code and the Schengen Borders Code could be affected if member states were allowed to continue concluding bilateral agreements in these fields. EU uh, competences would be concurrent in the field of readmission the exercise by the Union of this, the only explicit external competence of the whole area of freedom, security, and justice, exclude member states' external action from the moment the Union concludes an agreement with a given third country, or even since the adoption by the Council of a mandate to negotiate uh, a readmission agreement. This, in this case, it would be the duty of loyal cooperation, uh, which according to the court, marks the start of a concerted, well, the adoption of the, of the mandate marks the start of a concerted strategy at the international level. And also these competences of the EU will be concurrent in the fields of legal migration and integration of migrants, although the legal and political difficulties for their exercise are more important. Uh, and as you know, also member states' powers remain exclusive on the decisions on the volumes of admission of economic migrants from the third countries. An important incentive, therefore, that the Union does not have in its hands. The competence of the EU and, of the EU and member states would be parallel if, uh, when it comes to the use of development cooperation for migration purposes, without the Union action having preemption effects on member states' powers. Consequently, we see clearly that the setting of any cooperation on migration and asylum with third countries needs or requires a close association between the EU and its member states. And procedurally speaking, this is the same for the organization of the external representation of the EU. Uh, the Commission, as you know, ensures the external representation of the Union 
with the exception of the common foreign security policy, which corresponds to the president of the European Council and the high representative vice president of the Commission, and then deciding who is in charge of representing internationally the EU on migration and asylum does not depend on the category of authorities involved, but on the subject matter. So that's why it, it would be for the Commission, but what's the extent of the Commission representation role with regard to the scope of union competences, and what's the coordinating role that the European External Action Service should play in that regard. Member states will be able, therefore, to represent themselves when we, when we are talking about competences still in their hands, but we need to clarify uh, what, uh, how uh, member states can look for a concerted representation. So in addition to represent themselves, whether they can look for other alternatives in view of ensuring the goal of the unity of the internal representation of the EU as the court has requested. So although these uh, legal questions raised uh, do not normally go out of fashion, uh, there are certainly periods in which there is a need, uh, um, uh, a need to reflect more thoroughly on them which appears politically imperative. And we think this is the case of the two issues we are going to address uh, in this workshop. The first being then the eu Turkey statement in light of the general court orders of last year, and then the current negotiations on the UN Global Compacts on Refugees and Migration. For the first one, as you know, on the 28th February last year, the General Court issued three orders, three identical orders in cases NF, NG, and NM, uh, three annulment actions brought by several asylum seekers against the EU-Turkey statement of March 2016. The applicants in these cases considered that the EU-Turkey statement was an act attributable to the, Euro to the European Council, establishing an international agreement between the EU and Turkey, and that should be annulled for being contrary to the Charter of Fundamental Rights and also to the EU asylum acquis, and even to the procedural requirements of Article 218 of the TFEU on the conclusion of international agreements. The European Council, for its part, claimed a plea of inadmissibility, saying that neither it or any other institution was the author of the EU-Turkey statement, but this was issued out of an international summit between member states and Turkey. The General Court, as you know, has confirmed, well, has confirmed, no, has, has stated the lack of jurisdiction of the court, establishing that this was a measure attributable to the heads of state or government of the member states, it, was, it is important to emphasize how the General Court uh, indicated that even if it could admittedly been implied that the representatives of the member states had acted in their capacity as members of the European Council, uh, the, and notwithstanding the regrettably ambiguous terms of the eu Turkey statement, it was in their capacity as heads of state or government that they met with the Turkish Prime Minister, and the court focused on the explanations given by the European Council, so in the, in the intention of the author, the presumed author, and the document sent to member states in preparation for the meeting. That agreement then, an agreement, a treaty, political agreement, was uh, concluded by the member states with Turkey outside then of the court's jurisdiction. These orders have, of course, prevented the General Court from ruling on the nature of the statement, whether it's a treaty or a political instrument, a soft law instrument, and also on its compatibility with human rights and EU asylum law. So uh, you see clearly how these uh, orders raise several questions closely connected to the subjects uh, I have presented before, and on which the Court of Justice will have to reflect or is reflecting in this moment when replying to the appeal introduced by the applicants. So on the authorship question, what we can reflect on. The intention of the author received considerable and probably in my view too much weight on the argumentation of the court, but attending to the, uh, seeing the content of the statement and the circumstances of its adoption, which are the criteria that in fact the general court pointed at as being the most important, 
whether these criteria support the lack of EU involvement in the authorship of the statement. And uh, then, if that's not the case, and we assume that the EU Turkey statement is not an act attributable to a new institution, that means from a competence perspective <coughs> that the 28 member states would have collectively subscribed to a political agreement or an international treaty in fields within the scope of union external competence. <coughs> and this could be controversial, firstly, as regards those commitments included in the statement which arguably pertain to areas already covered to a large extent by common rules in the ERTA sense, in the sense of ERTA exclusivity, as it could be the case of the rules on the, the engagements on the management of asylum procedures or the visa liberalization process, which are covered by the procedures directive and by regulation 539 of 2001. Afterwards, return engagements which are contained in the, in the statement cannot be disconnected from the EU-Turkey readmission agreement of 2013, whose conclusion has transformed a new concurrent competence in the field of readmission into an exclusive one by exercise with regard to Turkey, preventing member states from entering into new commitments in that field with that country. Even though the non-affection clause of the EU readmission agreement with Turkey allows for the application of bilateral agreements or arrangements, uh, as uh, the, the future agreements or arrangements as between Turkey and Greece, which are referred to in the statement, would be clearly excluded as a result of the preemption effects of the Union external action, and only with the exception of implementing protocols of the EU readmission agreement. The fact that the, the, the clauses, the, the readmission obligations regarding third country nationals of the EU-Turkey readmission agreement only enter into force in October 2017, so after the statement, is not relevant since the moment from which the agreement would have preemption effects would be the signature, not the entry into force. Further, this is a complicated one, assuming member states' authorship of the statement with Turkey would also be controversial as regards the collective action of member states in fields of concurrent competence not yet exercised by the Union. It could be argued, it could be argued here, that if an individual member state is entitled to act in a field of concurrent competence, so member states acting collectively could do the same thing. But uh, the opposite position, as you may imagine, may be backed in my view by the following arguments. The common external rules agreed on the statement with Turkey show that the requirements for the exercise of union competences would have been fulfilled. For instance, subsidiarity principle or even the conditions for opinion 176 doctrine that, well, we can discuss it uh, afterwards if you wish, are in my opinion the criteria to be fulfilled when exercising implied concurrent competences. So member states acting jointly outside the EU framework and preventing the union from exercising its competence would have infringed the EU legal order, especially the principle of conferral of powers, the duty of loyal cooperation for not allowing the union to fulfill its obligations arousing, arising out of the treaties. And in this sense, I think that the margin of action which is left by Article 2.2 of the TFAU, so on concurrent competences, cannot be interpreted in a way to mean that member states can decide not to apply the rules of the treaties, but to enter collectively into an agreement with a third country. <coughs> so this could also run contrary even to Article 13.2 of the TEU, which provides that each institution must act in conformity with the procedures, conditions, and objectives set out in the treaties. So that procedural framework would not be at the disposal of member states within fields of union competence to say, well, uh, now is not the union who will exercise this competence, but we are going to do this collectively. And the rejection, to be clear, the rejection of this extra treaty decision making for cooperating with third countries does not transform, I'm not saying this transforms a union concurrent competence into an exclusive one, but will compel member states governments to use the EU framework, even if opting for soft law instruments. But there are other issues 
that we can comment on, such as uh, whether there is indeed a reviewable act. The court, the general court told us that there is not because this is, uh, this is not a new law act. But imagine that the general court had taken another view or the court of justice does on the appeal. Other questions to be addressed would be whether the statement has legal effects or not, so to be able to be uh, reviewable under an annulment action. And in this regard, I, could say, I would say that the general court orders are not only against ERTA case law in the sense that it has implicitly been accepted that member states have entered into international commitments affecting the unim of uniform application of common rules, so it's not a, just against ERTA exclusivity, but it could be also against the reasoning underpinning the annulment examination of the council proceedings leading to the negotiations of the ERTA agreement in the, in the 70s. In that judgment, in the ERTA judgment in 1971, the, to the Council inadmissibility objection in that case, the court replied that it was necessary to first determine who was competent to conclude the ERTA agreement as the legal effects of the measure in question would differ. So the fact that member states' proceedings in that moment dealt with the negotiations of the ERTA agreement, which fell into a field of easy exclusive competence, imply that those proceedings had legal effects on the relations between the community and member states and on the relationship amongst EU institutions. More particularly, the court at that moment focused on the content on the act and not on the intention of the authors and highlighted that in ERTA, the proceedings settling the negotiating position aimed at having the ERTA agreement adapted to the provisions of the community system present uh, similarities with our case in which the content of the EU Turkey statement also refers to EU law rules and to the role of EU institutions in the implementation of the agreed commitments. So <coughs> the court in ERTA said that uh, the ERTA proceedings could not have been simply the expression of a voluntary coordination among member states, but a course of action binding or having effects on the institutions and member states, just like the EU Turkey statement. So competence analysis was, in my view, crucial for the annulment action to be admissible in the 70s, and the court has followed this reasoning in other judgments from which the general court preferred to deviate when omitting to address the competence question. We would have also other uh, issues to address if uh, we were to assume that the EU-Turkey statement is an EU law act, we would have uh, uh, even, well, we would have still the problem of admissibility threshold, whether the individuals have uh, uh, a locus standing to start with this annulment action, and also even if it, it, this is attributable to the European Council, whether the procedural requirements of primary law to enter into commitments with third countries have been respected or, or, or not. And finally, although this workshop is deemed to focus on questions of distribution of competences and external representation, the compatibility of the statement with human rights, with EU asylum law, cannot be overlooked by a jurist. So we can comment on that also. On the second part, and here I will be much brief, so I think I am on the right timing track. Um, so in addition to the EU-Turkey case, we have selected the current discussions that you know are um, uh, ongoing within the United Nations towards the adoption of the global compacts on refugees on the one hand and on safe, orderly and regular migration on the other, in which both uh, the Union and its member states take part. Because we think that uh, similar legal questions arise there. In the 2016 New York Declaration on Refugee, for Refugees and Migrants, uh, states decided to launch a process of intergovernmental negotiations leading towards the adoption of, of two instruments in 2018, the Global Compact on Refugees, which comprises this comprehensive response framework and a program of action to be applied to large-scale refugee movements, and the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, setting out principles, commitments, and, 
understandings on all the dimensions of migration in order to present a framework for enhanced international cooperation. These compacts will be, well, the, as it was announced this morning, the, um, the zero draft for the refugee, for the refugee compact was released uh, last night and the zero draft for the migration compact will be released on Monday. So uh, here, uh, it is a process of intergovernmental negotiations uh, which <coughs> are taking place in the sphere of the UN General Assembly. For the uh, migration compact, we will have an international conference at the end who will ad which will adopt the, the instrument and it is already uh, Morocco, which has been appointed to host the intergovernmental conference in, at the end of 2018. And for the refugee compact, it is to be drafted by the UNHCR and then consulting with member states and other stakeholders, among which we find, surely, the European Union. So if we look at the content, or at least at the documents we, fa we have access to, it seems that these instruments will cover areas corresponding to both EU and member states' competence. You have reception conditions, refugee admission procedures, resettlement, refugee status, border management, fight against smuggling and trafficking, return, readmission, migrants' admission, migrant status, and even development and humanitarian assistance. So in the abstract, it is true we cannot make conclusive assertions on the distribution of competences in these fields, but at least it seems clear that this is, is, these issues correspond to fields in which EU and member states' competitors are intertwined. So neither the Union nor the member states could negotiate and sign these compacts without each other, even if the resulting agreements, instruments, are not to be legally binding, since, as you know, the distribution of competences is to be respected, as the court recalled, for instance, in 2004 in France against the Commission, that this distribution of competence shall be respected even for the adoption of political commitments. Because the EU cannot engage itself, even politically, to implement measures in fields in which it is not competent, and of course the same goes for member states. So the questions to be addressed here is, uh, are which and whose competence are involved, really, in the compacts, how the European uh, participation is being orchestrated in these negotiations, who is precisely speaking on behalf of whom. The Union, as I said before, should be represented uh, accordance to, with Article 17 of the TEU by the Commission, but what uh, kind of, uh, what competences are to be covered by the Commission? Only Union exclusive competences and already exercised concurrent competences or also concurrent competences not yet exercised, how the international representation of EU member states should be organized, how it's being organized in this case. Although legally possible, it seems that member states have, as, have not assigned their representation to, for instance, the rotating presidency of the Council or the Commission, which would be legally possible. It seems that they are representing themselves, but also the union is there, and we are also uh, looking at the coordinating role of the European uh, Action Service and whether what capacity it, is, it has uh, on the coordination of uh, both levels of action. So even we could wonder how third countries perceive the complex external representation of the EU bloc in international negotiations. So here we have another case in which the distribution of external competence between the Union and member states and their external representation appears crucial. We cannot pronounce ourselves yet on the exact scope of these compacts or the added value for addressing the challenges of international migration, but we can already be sure that if these legal considerations are not taken into account, the credibility and efficiency of the EU external action on migration will be questioned. So this is what we have asked our speakers to talk about, and uh, they will um, probably, they will touch on these issues, and the, the richness we find is that even if some of the issues will recurrently 
uh, being raised, we will have different perspectives and uh, different expertise on each of these points. Uh, and I leave it here. Thank you.